Good morning and welcome to Word of Faith Radio, a media outreach of Brent Whetstone Ministries. Today on our program, Kingdom of Cult Scientology, we will be discussing some of the current events of the church and what makes it a cult. As always, we encourage you to check us out on Facebook by visiting facebook.com backslash Brent W. Min and following us on Twitter at Brent Whetstone. You can chat with us live during the show via the Spreaker app. And then at the end of the show, we will once again take your questions via the chat, Twitter, or you can contact us on Skype by searching for Word of Faith Radio. I have a special announcement to make uh, for my regular listeners. Uh, when we launched Word of Faith Radio, uh, we intended it for uh, to be a program where we started to spread the gospel and message of faith and healing. And recently we took on this program, Kingdom of Cults, and we started with Scientology, and we got some great feedback with Scientology, was able to share some of my experience in the Scientology cult. And because of that positive impact that we got from that, and the fact that we got away from what the original intention of Word of Faith Radio was, We are going to be launching a new program starting today with this broadcast called Cult Watch. And what that program will be, it will broadcast at the same time from 10.30 to 11 with questions following up, focusing on Scientology with the sole purpose and mission of exposing the cult of lies that Scientology is. Now for our regular Word of Faith broadcasters, we will start broadcasting our regular Word of Faith program next Sunday evening at 7 p.m. from 7.30, so we encourage you to tune in for that. However, from 10.30 to 11, Saturday mornings will be devoted to our new program, Cult Watch, Focus on Scientology and Exposing the Lies that it is. Now, today we're going to focus on quite a few things. There's so much going on in the Scientology world right now. Um, But I want to kick things off uh, with an interview that uh, Good Morning America played of Nicole Remini. So we're going to listen to that and then I'm going to talk a little bit about that. New details on actress Leah Remini's recent decision to leave the sometimes controversial Church of Scientology. She's been quiet since making the announcement last week, but now her sister Nicole is speaking out. ABC's Dan Harris has the story. What's, what's happening here? I'm saying my prayers. Leah Remini, former star of the hit CBS sitcom King of Queens, was a famous and outspokenly proud member of Scientology. So when she dropped out, it made headlines. Since the news broke last week, Remini has not explained why she left, only issuing a statement expressing her sincere and heartfelt appreciation for the support she has received. But now Remini's sister, Nicole, who left the church herself several years ago, is coming forward, giving interviews to People magazine and a local radio station in Minnesota. We have been involved in Scientology for 30, 35 years of our life. So you can imagine the circle of friends that my mother has, my sister has. They literally have pulled in these people and told them they had to choose between relationships with my sister and my mother or the church. Well, I'm going to tell you, these people chose the church. Nicole Remini says her sister's relationship with the church began to sour in 2006 at the wedding of Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes, where Leah Remini reportedly asked the head of the church, David Miscavige, who was also Tom Cruise's best man, where his wife was. Miscavige's wife, Shelley, has not been seen publicly in many years. Remedy says her sister was rebuked by church officials for asking about this. She was totally shocked. She didn't, she did not at all expect that type of response. And then it just kind of escalated from there. According to Leah's sister, when Leah asked if she could call Shelley Miscavige, she was asked to write a letter and that the church would hand it to her. The church claims that Shelley Miscavige is a private person and just does not like to be seen in public. The church has publicly denied the story about Remini confronting David Miscavige at Tom Cruise's wedding. The church has also repeatedly denied that members are forced to cut themselves off from former church members saying such decisions are voluntary. 
As for those reports about Shelley Miscavige, the church released a statement to ABC News overnight saying Mrs. Miscavige continues her work in the church as she always has. Leaving the church has been a huge life changer for Leah Rimini. She's been a member since age nine, even serving for a year, according to her sister, in the church's elite religious order known as Sea Org. But this morning, her sister tells ABC News Leah is holding up well with the support of her family. For Good Morning America, Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Thanks to ABC News and Good Morning America for that clip. Now, this... Leah Remini thing is not going away, and I'm fully seeing it being the thorn in the side of David Miscavige that can bring down this church. She's starting to expose stuff that we in the movement, or who got out of the movement, have been talking about for years now. But now we have a celebrity voice who's talking about and confirming everything that we've been talking about. So, this isn't going away. Now, we all know that Shelley is at uh, the Church of Spiritual Technology as part of her uh, rehabilitation to get back in the good graces of her husband. And I fully expect at the next major event that they're going to bring her out, but they're going to have to spend some time putting weight on her and getting her to look good because the news is going to be there and they're going to want to show her off to show that there's nothing going on. So if you're listening in today, two things I want you to do. Get on Twitter and tweet, where is Shelly Miscavige? I want to start bringing so much attention to the Shelly Miscavige thing that the news does not let it go. And I also want to give a plug to a website. Uh, it is whoisshellymiscavige.com. I encourage you to visit that, tell your friends about it. We need to keep this on the forefront so the media keeps it on the forefront and it's not something that they put on the back page. This is causing so much stress within the church right now that they don't know how to handle it. So much so that I tweeted Kirstie Alley two days ago and asked her simply, where is Shelley? And it got my Twitter account blocked from Kirstie Alley. So the church is very scared of this Shelley Miscavige scandal that's going on right now. Um, and they should be. Here's a woman who has been out of the public limelight, out of any public events for six, seven years now. And we know that the church has a habit when people start asking questions of bringing them back for their big events that they have down in Clearwater. You see them all dressed up, looking nice, and then you never see them again. So the more that we can talk about Shelley Miscavige, the more that we can get it out there on social media, the more the media is going to pay attention to it. So if you are on Twitter right now, tweet something with the hashtag, where is Shelly Miscavige? Now last week, uh, we were taking questions, and some of the questions that came across uh, were in regards to my opinions on keeping Scientology working, and I wanted to address that as I go into the next segment of the show. Um, the question was, what was my general opinion of keeping Scientology working uh, when I read it, that many people believe that that's when LRH went off the deep end and um, things started to take the cult-like turn. Well, the first time I read Keeping Scientology Working, it was for, um, I believe, my volunteer minister course. And I was so into Scientology at this point that when I read Keeping Scientology Working, I was like, that's right, that's exactly how it should be. If you were taking the tech and you were twisting it, and you were distorting it, and you were making it something that it's not, you should be punished. If you're mixing Scientology and Dianetics with other things, then that's a crime against Scientology, and that's a crime against us as Scientologists. So I thought that LRH was spot on when he wrote it, and I was like, yeah, that's what we should be doing. But now that I'm outside of the cult, and I've read uh, Keeping Scientology Working from an Open Mind perspective, I know that that was just a way for them to control their students, for them to control anyone who's coming in, working on staff, joins the Sea Org, anyone that's under their influence. They're basically threatening you 
with this policy letter. And the biggest threat that they make, and it's something that they swear up and down that does not exist, and that's disconnection. The church swears up and down that there's no such thing as disconnection in the modern day church, that that policy was canceled in 1969, LRH issued a new policy that said any previous policy on disconnection is hereby canceled, that the church no longer follows it. But we know that's not true, because in the PTSSP course, on page 206, there's a bulletin that's dated 10 September 1983 called PTSness and Disconnection. And this bulletin tells you how and why you should disconnect from someone. And it's funny. This policy was brought to my attention and this course was brought to my attention when I was on staff in Cleveland. Um, my wife had come up. She was doing the Success Through Communication course. She blew off the course and she started causing waves with the mission. Now the public executive secretary said, have you ever heard of the PTSSP course? And I was like, no. He said, that's the next course you need to do. You need to do it because you're going to be able to handle people in your life who talk down against Scientology and who are going to prevent your progress up the bridge. I didn't ever want to do the course, so I ended up not taking it, and I bought the materials off of eBay uh, recently and was reading through it. And I see why. Because there's this whole section on how to handle potential trouble sources and handle the disconnection. What the mission was trying to do was either to get me to handle my wife and keep her calm and get her on the bridge or to disconnect from her. And the particular point in the bulletin that I want to talk about is the, it's on page, let me turn to it, um, 209, and it's how to disconnect. And I'm just going to read a, a little part of it. Um, it gives you three examples of how to disconnect and which situations you should disconnect in. But then the last paragraph in the how to disconnect section is the paragraph that talks about how you should handle your disconnect. Okay, so it says to fail or refuse to disconnect from a suppressive person not only denies the PTS case gain, it is also supportive of the suppressive, in itself a suppressive act, and it must be so labeled. And they reference uh, HCO policy 23rd December 1965, suppressive act, suppression of Scientology and Scientologists. So what they're saying is if you don't disconnect from someone who is PTS, then you yourself are supporting their suppressive act, and you yourself are becoming suppressive. Now, we'll remember a few years back, Tommy Davis was on CNN, and he talks about this policy of disconnection. He's asked about it, and I'm going to play a clip from that. It's about a minute and a half long, and here's what the church's official stance on disconnection is. Uh, something about the church, and this is what this group Anonymous is protesting. They, they, they claim that the church separates family members, and there, there is this um, practice of disconnection, where if you're a member of the Church of Scientology, to the best of my understanding here on, on, on this issue, because I'm not a member and I don't fully understand it, but if you're a member of the sure. Church of Scientology, and someone in your family, or a friend, or your spouse is skeptical or critical of the Church of Scientology, you are supposed to disconnect yourself from that person. And, and Jenna Miscavige Hill, who is a nurse, uh, a nurse, a niece rather, of the church's leader, David Miscavige, says that happened to her, which is the reason she left the church a couple of years ago. And she now has a website bringing together former members of the Church of Scientology to talk about issues like this. Well, I mean, first of all, this is a perfect example of how the internet um, turn, turns things and twists things. There, there's no such thing as, 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 as disconnection as you're characterizing it. And, and certainly, mm -hmm. you have to understand, 
Well, what is Scientology? Scientology is a new religion. You have the majority of Scientologists in the world, they're first generation, so their family members aren't going to be Scientologists and this kind of thing. And, and Scientology absolutely mandates, and it's really part of, uh, of, of the code of being a Scientologist to, to respect the religious right. beliefs of others. So certainly, well, someone well, who's a Scientologist well, is going to respect their family members' beliefs. Well, and, what, and, what is, what and, is and we consider then? family to be a, a, a building block of, of, of any society. So a, anything that's characterized as disconnection or this kind of thing, it, it's, just, right. it's just not true. There, there isn't well, any such policy that, in the church that, that's dictating who people should or should not be in communication with. You know, it's, it, it just doesn't happen. Well, now we see from the Course that that's a blatant lie. And Tommy was very good when he was the spokesperson for the church of blatantly lying. John Sweeney caught him on so many lies um, that it was funny to see him stumble over lie after lie after lie after lie. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tommy is actually no longer in the Church of Scientology. He's no longer in the Sea Org. Him and his wife got out, uh, I believe it was two years ago, because of the way he handled his interviews on TV, David Miscavige was not happy with him. So, right now, we're seeing disconnection happen, and if you are on Twitter and you're following anyone who's a Scientologist celebrity, um, you're seeing that Leah Remney is suffering from disconnection. Kirstie Alley is leading the charge with this disconnection. So... They had a meeting a couple days back at Celebrity Center. Kirstie Alley requested it on how these celebs should handle dealing with Leah Remney. And they got their orders from this course and from this bulletin of 10 September 1983. They have to disconnect with her or they're not going to be able to progress up the bridge. So it's great that Leah Remney has left Scientology. It's great that she's a celebrity figure because I think she's going to be very intermenstrual and instrumental, excuse me, in bringing to light the abuse that happens in Scientology. And I don't think David Miscavige is going to be able to weather the storm that he's facing. It's only a matter of time before his corrupt empire starts to collapse from within. We've had high ranking members of the church leave very publicly, and now we're starting to see it with the celebrities. They're starting to see what those high-level members were talking about, and they're getting fed up with the human rights violations that are going on within the church. They're getting fed up with the constant money requests. The IAS was never intended to be a fundraising arm of Scientology, but it's become that. I remember when I was on staff in uh, Cleveland, I was asking about the purpose of the IAS and why it was important for me to buy my membership. And I was told that the whole goal of the IAS is if the police were to come in and raid the mission in Cleveland and shut it down, that within 24 hours, the IAS would have another mission up and running on the other side of town. And it is designed that way. The IAS is there to ensure that Scientology moves forward no matter what the cost and that they have a very large war chest build up because of all the donations. So it was important for me to donate to the IAS. Not only should I buy my lifetime membership at $5,000, but then I should continue to give to the IAS because it's that money that's going to ensure that keeping Scientology working policy is fulfilled in its fullest and that Scientology will be able to clear the planet because we are the only ones who have the answers. Now, I want to talk a little bit about my, my experience in Scientology. For anyone who's listening that might be getting into Scientology or might be exposed to Scientology for the first time, let you know what it's actually like to be a Scientologist and what they do to their members. Now, I live three and a half hours away from Buffalo. I was on course in Buffalo for one week before I blew, and I left Scientology. I was doing the minister's course. So I went up to go on course for the very first day. I drove three and a half hours. I left at six o'clock in the morning, got there at about 10 o'clock, 
went in, paid for my my course, sat down with the bookstore officer, got my materials, and then immediately got taken into an auditing room by one of their auditors. They were talking to me, and they were like, so we hear your wife's not into Scientology. And I was like, well, yeah, she's not a Scientologist. Okay, well, we're going to teach you how to handle that. So they talked to me about different things on how to handle my wife and what to do to get her interest up in Scientology and what not to talk about when I'm talking to her about Scientology. So they were teaching me how to handle her based upon different things in the PTS SP course. I spent an hour in the auditing room. After that, they took me out and I showed me around the building and let me tell you, when I was in Buffalo in 2009, this building was falling apart. There was carpet that was tore up. There was water stains on the walls, on the ceiling tiles. And there was about three people in the course room. So we go into the course room. They're showing me around. And then they take me to a little library. And there was all of LRH's materials in there. And they're like, here's all LRH's materials you're free to use these whenever you need to use them. And I was like, great, so I don't need to buy my basics then because they're all here. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You still need to buy your basics, but this is so you don't have to transport your basics up here. Well, I got my basics, and I spent $300 on the entire basic book and lectures set on eBay. There's no way I was going to pay the three grand to the church. Um so they showed me around the building, showed me the chapel, and they said, this is where graduation happens. This is where we'll allow you to conduct our Sunday services. It's always packed, and it'll, it'll be great for you. And they showed me that the walls um, turn for it to become a banquet room, but then turn back into the chapel. So when it's the chapel, it has on the walls the creeds of the Church of Scientology and different quotes from LRH. When it's a public space, when they're using it for banquets, there are different uh, things on the wall that promote Scientology, different quotes talking about what Scientology can do for you. So after that hour, this is two hours that I'm in Buffalo right now, still I have not been on course. So I go back up to the bookstore level. I was in the bookstore. And they started showing me the e-meter. And they said, well, now as a minister of the Church of Scientology, we want you to start going up the training route. In order to do that, you need to buy the following courses. And they listed off the left side of the bridge, the different courses that I need to, be, to uh, purchase. And they said, we actually have a special going on right now. For $15,000, we can get you so far up the bridge and get you auditing people with the meter. Now... The $15,000 covered the cost of the courses, the materials for the courses, and the brand new e-meter. And I said, well, I don't have $15,000. And they're like, well, here, come with us. And they brought me into this room, and I don't know if the room still exists since they remodeled it and relaunched uh, the Buffalo Org. But it was a room that was all glass, and it sat in the center of a much larger room. And I had three Sea Org members bring me into this room and hand me a phone. And they said, do you have a credit card? And I said, well, yeah, everyone has a credit card. Call right now and get your limit up. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to up my limit from $1,000 to $15,000. Like, that's a pretty big leap. Call them, put the postulate out there, and they're going to up your limit to $15,000. And you're going to pay for the courses today and you're going to be on your way up the bridge. So, I called the credit card company, knowing that they weren't going to um, up my credit card limit, but I was doing this so I could get out of the room and get on course. I mean, I am here to study, after all. So I called the credit card company, the credit card company said, no, they're not going to up my limit. Um, that The $1,000 is the max that they're going to give me. So I get off the phone and I tell them that. And they said, well, that's okay. What you can do is you can go across the street. There's a bank over there that gives loans to Scientologists. They work with us closely. And we can get you a $15,000 loan. And I was like, well, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I mean, 
my wife would kill me if I took out a $15,000 loan to pay for Scientology. And they're like, well, she doesn't need to know about it. You're the breadwinner in the family. You pay the bills. And I said, well, actually, my wife and I split the bills. And at this time, she was making more money than I was making. I said, so technically, she's the breadwinner. And they said, well, let's just go. We need to do this. And I'm like, I, I'm not going to apply for a loan for $15,000 to pay for courses in Scientology. So then they had more Sea Org people come in. And there was only one way out of this room. And the room was blocked by three people in the Sea Org. And I had two auditors standing across from me trying to figure out why I would not want to take out a loan for $15,000 and then take these courses. And I told them, I cannot afford a $15,000 loan to go up the bridge. I spent five hours in the room with them trying to convince them that I could not do this before they finally let me go. By this point, it was lunchtime, or a little past lunchtime, and I ran and grabbed a bite to eat. Now, why they were interrogating me in this room, I ended up getting a parking ticket in Buffalo because the meter expired. So I ran and grabbed lunch with the intention of coming back and going on course. So I come in, and I was talking to my good friend Lynn Carey up at Buffalo, who sold me all my courses, and she sat me back down at her desk and started talking about payment plans that I could come up with this $15,000, and if they were to sell me bits and pieces of the courses at time. But the most important thing was is that I get my e-meter, that I needed to immediately buy that $3,500 e-meter, that way I can start working on the other purchases that I needed to pur purchase in order to go up the training side of the bridge. Another four hours went by. This was the never-ending bridge cycle. It finally was 9 o'clock at night. Now, mind you, I have a three-and-a-half-hour drive to get back home to Ohio. And I told him, I said, I I've got to go home. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got to go home. I've got a three and a half hour drive. So they finally let me go. And as I was leaving, I was walking through the public uh, information display section of Buffalo, and I got grabbed on the arm by another member of the Sea Org, Chris Latham. She grabbed me, and she sat me down and said, I'm only going to keep you a minute. I wanted to talk to you about something. And here it was. Here was my big pitch into the IAS. Chris Latham sat me down for another two hours and tried to get me to purchase my lifetime membership in the IAS. So in all, I spent zero minutes on course time, about two hours in auditing on how to handle my wife, which thankfully I didn't get billed on, and then about eight or nine hours in a never-ending reg cycle on you need to buy this, this is why you need to buy it, and if you don't buy it, you're not going to be able to clear the planet. Um, yes, I see a comment that I'm naming names. I will name all the names that I know to expose the corruption within the Church of Scientology. Now, I actually believe that there are good people in Scientology that they just don't know any better. And some of the staff names that I'm naming right now, they're just trying to earn a living. They're, they're making $50 a week and they have rent to pay. They have food to buy. So it, it, it's a sad, sad thing for um, the staff members up at Buffalo. And Lynn was always a nice person to me. Chris was a great person to me. Um, when there was an ethics situation at Scientology, she actually helped me Fill out the knowledge reports. Now, I I filled out the knowledge reports on the rtc.org website, which, real quick, I want to give a plug to the OSA members who are listening in today. We welcome you to the show. We hope that you are enjoying it. Um, as a matter of fact, I encourage any Scientologist who's listening right now to fill out a knowledge report on me uh, by visiting rtc.org and you will find that under the ethics section. 
go ahead and fill that out. And if you would just email me a copy of that uh, by emailing info at brentw.org, I would appreciate it. Um, once again, you could fill out your knowledge report on me by visiting rtc.org. I would love for um, them to get a hold of that in Buffalo. All right. So that was a bit of my experience at Buffalo. The second time I went up there, it was no different. I wasn't allowed on course. It was a never-ending reg cycle. Um, so I blew from course at that point. I, I never went back up. And as a matter of fact, my son was uh, born, I believe, a week, week and a half later uh, from the last time that I went up there. And really the last formal contact that I had with the Church of Scientology was uh, my son was born. I posted something on Facebook about it, and I got a phone call from a mission in Cleveland. How they tracked down my phone number, I have no idea, but they got my cell phone, and they called me while I was in the hospital. And Ron Baginski, the public exec up there, called me and said, Brent, whatever you do, do not let your son get vaccinated. And I'm like, okay, first of all, how did you get my phone number? And second of all, who the heck are you to tell me not to get my son vaccinated? And he started explaining to me that the vaccinations will cause so many things to go wrong with my, my son that if I want him to live a healthy, normal life, that we won't get him vaccinations. And I said, well, I have two kids who received vaccinations, and they don't have any issues, um, so my son's going to get vaccinated. And he said, you're, you're going to regret it. That's going to be the worst decision that you could ever make in your life. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, that was the last last contact I had, especially with Cleveland. Um, I did fill out a couple of knowledge reports on them. Not that it did any good. I just didn't appreciate them contacting me, especially in the hospital, in what should have been a congratulatory call. Instead, it was a call that was very controlling. Um, so, a few months later, three or four months later, I think it was, I, uh, I got my number changed again. I've actually gone through, like, my close friends laugh because every year, every year and a half, we actually change our cell phones and our cell phones numbers because Scientology tracks it down. And the last time they tracked it down, um, someone from, um, I think it was Los Angeles, it was a bridge recovery specialist called me to try and get me back on the bridge. They have a way of tracking down your information. and for, for some reason, they keep on tracking me down. I'm hoping with these broadcasts, they will finally declare me a suppressive person, person and will stop bothering me. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about um, some more of my experiences at Cleveland. I had some questions come in uh, the other day in regards to what it was like to be on staff and what um, we would do when we would see the anonymous protesters out there. And at the time when I, I would come in, I, I always thought it was funny that there were people out protesting Scientology. I'm like, obviously they don't understand what's going on, that if they really had an understanding of what the religion is and what it stood for, they wouldn't be out there protesting, they would be in the course room. Now, coming from a Christian background, I, I always like to share my religion. So, I asked the mission holder to allow me to go out and basically evangelize for Scientology. And I was instructed that I was not allowed to go out and have any contact with these people from Anonymous who are protesting. And I asked why. Why can't I have any contact with them? If they just knew what I knew, they would be just as excited as I was. And then they explained to me that all the protesters in Anonymous get paid $50 a day by the psych industry to come and protest our churches. And I kind of thought that was laughable. Um, 
the psych industry cares that much about Scientology that they're going to pay people $50 a day all over the world to protest the church. But then they released a video, and I'm going to talk more about Anonymous and its impact on Scientology next week, but they showed me a video that the church released about Anonymous and said that it was a terrorist organization and whatnot, and so they told me what we do when Anonymous, Anonymous shows up is we record them with our video cameras, we take pictures of their license plates, and then the mission holder would go and file a report with Buffalo. And what, what I believe when she was filing these reports is what was happening is that was given to the OSA officer that's stationed in Buffalo, and the descriptions, the videos, and the license plates, and then if they saw a pattern or they thought there was a threat from a particular individual, then the OSA would take over and deal with it from there. But we were not to have any contact with them. Now, the only thing I will say about the protesters is that they showed up at all the wrong times. They never showed up at any of the big events, um, which leads me to believe that they didn't know when the events were, which probably was intentional on Cleveland's part. Uh, they would do a lot of calling directly to the public, uh, Scientologists, letting them know when the events were, and they wouldn't advertise much. And I think it was to try and uh, curb any protests that we might get. Um, but there were a few times that I went up there to go on course, and there were there were a couple of younger members of Anonymous standing out uh, with Xenu signs, and um, one sign in particular was... And this was a sign, and I answered this on one of the message boards the other day. The sign that had the most impact on me was, religion is free, Scientology is neither. Meaning, Scientology is not free, nor is it a religion. Um, so, that that sign really got me to thinking. And there, there were a number of things that um, really led to me escaping Scientology... Uh, before I got too far in, but um, one of the things that I haven't shared before on the program with you guys is that when when all of this was going on and they were trying to get me to uh, disconnect from my wife without actually saying, hey, disconnect from your wife, they had a uh, young lady from Bridge call me. Uh, she was the bookstore, um, or she was the bookseller for the missions, and... Um, I'm not going to release her name because I actually still keep in contact with her and she's she's pretty high up over there in the organization but um they had her call me and start talking to me about how to deal with um handling my wife and one of the things she started to do was recruit me into the Sea Org and I'll never forget it was about a year and a half into um my my stint into Scientology, and I think it was my first year on staff that she uh, actually convinced me to join. And I was like, yeah, why wouldn't I want to be able to get my courses uh, paid for? Why wouldn't I want to be able to eat, sleep, and breathe Scientology? And uh, I actually signed my Sea Org contract, faxed it back out to uh, Los Angeles, and that's on record somewhere with the postulate or the the intention that I someday would come back on staff for Sea Org. And I say back on staff because they were convinced that I lived a life before this where I was a member of the Sea Org. Um, I will um, get a copy of my Sea Org contract that is signed by myself and... Um, Ron and Liz Baginski as my witnesses in the Scientology mission up in Cleveland. I'll scan that and I'll, uh, I'll let you guys distribute that however you want to do it. But um, I'm going to see if we can have my wife call in now and talk about a little bit of her experience with Scientology in Cleveland and what it was like for her as someone who didn't buy into... Uh, Scientology, but um, 
still took a course to appease me, and um, she did the success through communication course actually twice, I believe, in the matter of like two and a half hours. Um, so, Heather, if you're listening, you could go ahead and call in. After this segment, transition into the uh, question section, and uh, I invite you guys to uh, call in via Skype if you'd like to chat that way, or you can submit your questions through the, um, the chat feature on the Spreaker app or website, and then you could also tweet them to us at Brent Whetstone uh, on Twitter. While she is getting her Skype figured out, my wife, who's very technologically savvy, um, will go ahead to the chat and start answering some questions. So you guys can uh, go ahead and submit your questions via the chat right now. I'm scrolling through. Ah, and we have the call. Are you there, Heather? Okay. Uh... Guys who are listening, can you hear my wife? If so, could you type in and let me know? Okay, we're having issues with our Skype, so I'm actually going to have Heather come up, and uh, she will join us live in studio, which my acting studio right now is my office. Um, So, let me go to the question that was asked. After you got out, did you get any attempts to get you back online before the recent effort in past week or in the past week or so? Yes, actually, um, they would call me once or twice a week, and that's why I changed my number so many times because I was getting calls constantly. They have people who work at Bridge right now who are called Bridge Recovery Specialists, um, and their sole purpose is to call people who used to be on lines, who are no longer on lines, and they are to get them back on lines, back on the bridge, through the basics. The whole purpose is is to get you through the basics, and once you're through the basics, you're able to see that you made a mistake by leaving Scientology. Um, so now we have Heather in here. Say hi, Heather. Hi, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, my, my question to Heather, uh, I received this from some of our viewers or listeners. What, what courses have you done in Scientology? I did part of the communications course. Okay. So, could you tell us what your experience was when you came into the mission? Um, what they did, what they suggested course-wise, and how that all came about? Sure. Um, To appease my husband, who I loved very much, I went up with him to the mission one day um, to meet with the people who were running the mission. He said he just wanted me to give Scientology a fair shake and that I couldn't make an accurate decision about it myself until I had spoken with them, until I had done some reading and a little studying myself. So he twisted my arm. I went to the mission for a day, um, sat and talked with the people who ran the mission, you know, watched a little promo about Scientology. They gave me the personality test and brought me in and had me on the cans, which was a very funny experience because they determined I had no stress in my life except for my husband. He was the only thing that stressed me out. I can't Um, imagine. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know why. Um, But they decided after going through all of the material that the best course for me to start with was the Success Through Communications course. Heather, what's your... uh background college wise. <laughs> I have a degree in communication, so I thought it was kind of funny that Scientology was going to teach me something that uh, the university hadn't taught me already. Uh, but I decided to be fair to my husband, I would come in and I would attempt the course. Um, so I, we went up during an evening. It was actually the daughter of the people who ran the mission who conducted my course. And she and I got along. She was a very, very sweet, very intelligent girl. Um, and she, How old was she at this point? I think she was like 13 when she was she twinning with you. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, she was actually conducting the course. And I remember at the time her saying that she was astounded by how quickly I was going through the course materials, that she had never seen anyone succeed at the course um, as fast as I was doing. 
I actually completed all of the materials for the Success Through Communications course. Um, then her dad needed to go through it and sign off on it. And when he came into the room, he dismissed it all, said there was no way that I could have been as successful at it as I was, and that I was going to have to repeat the course with him conducting the course, uh, which we did start. Now, mind you, by this point, we'd been there almost four hours. Um, I was tired. I had small children at home. I really just wanted to leave. I had done what I agreed to do. But I had to sit down and spend two more hours with him. And the running joke was that I spent two hours staring at his unibrow because we were supposed to just make eye contact and uh, not make any sound, not have my breathing accelerate, not have me blush or my eyes get red or anything. Um, so I spent two hours staring at his eyebrow to prove to him that I was a successful communicator. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Success Through Communications course takes you through what's called training routines. And what the training routines are um, is it's how to train an auditor not to react to situations when they're in the auditing room. But they see that the Success Through Communications course can help people uh, who are all over the bridge or not even as Scientologists, just being able to uh, deal with situations in their lives without reacting. Now, it was originally designed by L. Ron Hubbard to teach his people how to um, basically pass a lie detector and um, how to pass any interrogations that they were to go through. It's teaching you how to lie and not to react to questions that are being asked. Um, one of the big training routines, and I forget which one it is, is called bull baiting. And uh, I actually have spoken to some people who were um, part of this training routine where there would be a male who was their twin who was helping them on the course and they would actually go over and start to unbutton their shirts um, and start reaching for their breast because they were trying to get them to react. That's the whole purpose is you need to get the person to react because they're given the instructions that they're not to react to any situations. Um, so the the guy who came out, uh, the young lady's dad, is the same guy who called me um, when we were in the hospital and told me not to get my my kid vaccinated. Um, so why Heather is still here before my children start to kill each other downstairs? Um, do you have any other questions for her? And yes, TRs are called indoctrination conditioning for re-education. Scientology thinks that they own um, the proper way to do everything, including studying. Um, that's why one of the uh, first courses they always have you take is the basic study manual or the learning how to learn. And basically you learn how to look up words in the dictionary and uh, clear those words of any misunderstandings that you might have. And Heather just said Play-Doh, making fun of the clay demos that you're required to do in all these courses. And clay demos make sense. <laughs> we use them with our perspective. Question for Heather. Did you seriously worry that you would lose me? Yes, I did. Um, Brent was involved with Scientology for quite a while. Um, at first, I thought it was just sort of a passing phase and I was just going to outlast it. Um, when he was getting farther in, it was costing more money, it was costing more time. Um, they were encouraging him to leave me, to get our kids involved. Um, that's really when my panic level went up. Um, I, I hate to admit that, you know, I, I did pray. I probably prayed more during the time he was a Scientologist than ever before in my life that something was going to happen to remove him from Scientology. Um, but there did reach a point where I, I was considering leaving the marriage. Um, something that still haunts me because obviously now we're very happily married now that he's out of it. Um, <laughs> but yes, I, I did seriously think I was going to lose him, that they were going to convince him to leave or that it was going to get to a point where it was affecting my children and that I was going to have to leave. Um... Another question that came up is uh, what has the 
Scientology org been doing to disseminate among schools and young people? They're using the um, the the drug pamphlets, the uh, anti-drug campaign that's really big with Scientology right now to get in there, um, and they use it from the the point that the the dr anti-drug group is not part of the Church of Scientology. It's a regular nonprofit that has no religious affiliation, kind of like the Way to Happiness campaign. Um, so they go in and they basically use that as a gateway for younger people to um, to get in and find out more about Scientology. And since we're talking about their anti-drug campaigns, I want to give a plug to another website, and that's Narconon Reviews. So uh, if you want to check that out, you could go to narcononreviews.net. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-R-E-V-I-E-W-S.net. Um, that's a newer website that's up. So check that out. That'll let you know a little bit about what Scientology's anti-drug um, activities look like. Another question for Heather. Any advice for other spouses who are experiencing what you did? Yeah. Be intelligent. Get as much information um, about the organization, about cults as you can. Uh, one of the things that I did, I would actually leave the house, and I only did this from work. I created um, email accounts that my husband did not know that I had, so that I had email addresses that I could use to go on um, anonymous chat boards, um, things like that, so that I was in the culture and that I was learning um, what people knew that had gotten out of the organization, um, what other families knew that had lived through having a member of Scientology in their family. Um, I did as much reading about Scientology as I could, and even reading actual materials published by Scientology so that I knew when <laughs> I used to harass Brent because he would talk to me and it was all in letters. I used to say, just use words. I can't understand all of these abbreviations for things. Um, I got her the uh, Scientology dictionary so she would know what I was talking about. <laughs> but you do. You need to know. You, you need to be able to follow the things that they're doing and know what they're getting involved in at each level. Um, you know, for, foreknowledge is being forewarned. It's an ability to fight back. So really just get out there and learn as much as you can. Um, also, if you're in a position where you can get hooked up with a support group, with a counselor, uh, Scientology is very good at making this come back at you and you know they will tell you you're a suppressive person well I didn't even know what that meant um, I was ready to buy myself a t-shirt that said proud to be an SP by the end of it um, but they will make it feel like it's your fault that you know your marriage is falling apart because you're the person who's not cooperating you're the person who's refusing to work on things so a little counseling a good friend um, just someone who can support you and make you feel less crazy while you're going through it is is the best advice that I can give. And I think one of the message boards that she was on was the Why We Protest um, message boards. Yeah. So somewhere out there she has an account on Why We Protest. Yeah. But one of the things that Scientology does, and I don't know if I covered this last week, but when, when I went up to Buffalo, before I was allowed to go on course, I actually had to fill out a, a document that um, stated, one, that I wouldn't sue the church under no circumstances, Two, that I wouldn't ask for any money back. And three, giving the church the right, if I were to ever be committed into a psych institution, that they have a right to come and pick me up and offer me treatment so they completely um, cut your spouse or your children out and you give all your uh, power of attorney to the Church of Scientology. I have since um, come up with another form that cancels any other form before that, so that that currently doesn't stand. Um, no, I did not get any professional counseling after I got out. Um, we have talked to different pastors and stuff uh, a little bit about our experience, but we really recovered things in our marriage on our own. Um, so, but I definitely recommend um, seeing a counselor, um, and if you really want to take them off, go see a psychiatrist. But um, seeing, seeing a counselor, if you are a couple who's suffering through that, would, would be a good thing. Um, what has been the reaction of my Christian friends to your opposition to the cult? Um, 
Well, if my boss is still listening, which he may be listening, uh, who's one of my very good Christian friends, they, they are very supportive. Um, they, they think it's important to expose the cult because people, it's very easy to get into it. And now they have these, uh, they relaunch the personal efficiency courses, um, the, the marriage courses, and, and all the entry-level $50 courses where they can get people suckered into it without really exposing what Scientology is. And once you go through all those minor courses and you've spent so much money and you start agreeing with some of the stuff, then they, they lay it on to you heavy. But um, that that's their new tactic is to get you in like on the marriage course or on the finance course or how to raise your kids course because the stuff in there does make sense and it's not not bad at this point but it's when you get beyond these entry level courses that it starts to take on its cult activities but that's what they're good at they're good at finding where you have a weakness or where you have an insecurity you know maybe you're you're fighting with your spouse so you're worried about your marriage oh we'll come take the marriage course and we'll teach you how to fix it or you're a shy person and you don't communicate well well we have a course for that that's how they sucker you in and i think they bring you in and they plant it in your brain that you are weak, that you are nothing without them, that they're the ones that are going to save you and build you up. And that's just a dangerous psychological game to get into. And I think that's why it's so hard for people to get back out of it. I agree. Let's see. Um, my time involved was too short, but so many execs experience PTSD symptoms after leaving. No, none of that hit me. Um, I, like I shared in the first lesson, I actually researched Scientology before I got into Scientology. So I kind of knew about some of the Z News stuff and all that that was going on. And at that point that I got on, I considered myself an atheist. So reading that kind of stuff... Um, like the bad stuff about Scientology. I just thought there were people who were upset with the church who were leaving. So I went in knowing that there there were um, issues with the church, but I guess ignoring those issues until I experienced them firsthand. But the only, the only bad thing that they ever did was like that one time I uh, talked about that they wouldn't let me go to the zoo with my family or they would write me up on ethics charges. So... Um, I, I didn't get anywhere near the treatment that some of the people get when they are working at the much larger, larger organizations. Like the mission in Cleveland, there were four, four or five staff. And it was the mission holder, her husband, their daughter, the, um, the one auditor, and then me as the bookstore officer slash not fully headed chaplain. And Heather's going to go ahead and leave for now. Um, are there any other questions before we end our broadcast? Thank you, Heather. Okay, great. Well, it looks like there are no more questions that are coming in, so we're going to go ahead and end the broadcast there for today. Um, look me up. If you guys have any other questions, you can email me at info at brentw.org. Um, tweet me, however you want to get in contact. Next week, uh, we're going to be discussing Anonymous and the impact of Anonymous on the Church of Scientology. And then we'll also cover some more of the Scientology headlines because I suspect this week's going to be just as busy in the news cycle with Scientology as it was this previous week. Um, and remember, make sure you tweet where is Shelly Miscavige today as much as you can. It would be awesome if we could get that trending. That way the news would take uh, an interest in it and keep asking questions. And hopefully Leah does call the FBI because it's a uh, serious, serious situation when there's someone who goes missing for six or seven years, and we know that she's not the only one who's missing. 
Um, there's still a few of the higher ups that are missing that no one's seen or heard from in years. So thanks for tuning in. You guys have a great day. Thanks.